Welcome to another edition of Resilient Living Podcast, a show dedicated to improving quality of life for both people and planet through liberation and independence, moving in from surviving to thriving and living life on your own terms. Uh, this is episode 26, and this is how to start spin farming, part one. I want to see how well this does with you guys, if you guys like this sort of topic. I think that you should because we got a lot of crazy things going on with real estate right now. It's super expensive. It's crazy out there, and I think a lot of people can't afford to buy land. And a lot of them want to start supporting themselves, start creating their own food, uh, which I think that you should. But it's very difficult out there. And I'm here to tell you guys it's not, it's difficult, but it's not impossible. It's called spin farming. And how do I know? Because I actually do it. I farm off somebody else's land that I don't own. And I want to talk about today of how to find that type of land, uh, the type of land you should look for, the right type of people, the smoothness of operations, and a few things you should probably look out for. Uh, where you can lose your investment big time and how to avoid that. So let's jump in. Uh, finding land. How do you even find land? Uh, one of the things I do, the best one, uh, word of mouth is good. Put the word out there in your neighborhood. The best, best thing you can do is go to Facebook and you're going to go to these group sites. Uh, Friends of Fallbrook actually is where I'm at. Fallbrook, California. I live in San Diego, North County uh, here in California. And basically what I did is put out a message out there. Hey, friends of fill in the blank city uh, join it first and just put a message out there be as detailed as you can uh, hey I'm going to pay the water I'm looking for land uh, here's a picture of myself you know clean up take a nice picture don't look like an alien out there uh, and, and what I stated is basically we're gonna maintain portion of your land as far as like weed eating and things like that we're gonna pay all the water that is used to produce the food not your entire water bill at your home you know, and we're going to give you a fresh uh, uh, basket of produce at every harvest. So give before you, you take. Uh, and I've, I actually had like 40, 50 uh, uh, invitations, uh, opportunities, and it, it was so big, I had to label them, take pictures of the properties, make notes, all kinds of different things, uh, because there's just so many uh, uh, pieces of property. Now, if you wanted to raise uh, quail or chickens or things like that, it's not just about growing vegetables and things like that. You can do all kinds of stuff on land that you don't own. And the, the, the most exciting thing for me is that this is entrepreneurial. This is a way to actually make money if you want to start an entire business. Uh, there's a guy by the name of Curtis Stone. Uh, he was the second guy I found. There was people before him that actually came up with this concept. And they're making like $100,000 a year. So guys, this could be really big. Whether you're looking to make money or you're looking to just to support yourself and eat some of the healthiest food on the planet, the land is there. You just need to go grab it. So what type of land should you get? Uh, I think that you should get relatively flat land. Uh, I know those living in the big cities. And, and let me make a note here too, guys. This is anywhere. This is up in the mountains. If you were renting a cabin, you know, on a small little behind someone's house or something like that, there's people out there who want to have this kind of stuff going. They've got the land. They just don't want to do anything with it. So they're eager, but you're going to want to try to find the land that's as flat as possible. Now you want to take certain things into consideration if you live in flash flood like South Carolina, Texas, things like that where you get big deluges of rain. Uh, you're going to want to watch out because you don't want to get your garden flooded. So you're going to want to have to take a look at the land and kind of survey it. Uh, I'll give you guys a tip here is look at the erosion in the soil. Uh, even on relatively flat land, not, not necessarily uh, greatly sloped. But what you're going to find is that there's a lot of uh, pondy waters. You're going to find uh, like cuts in the ground where the water starts running. That's a good indication of, hey, uh, this place is, is not level. It's, it's level. Maybe it's a little too level and you're maybe inside of like a bowl. You want to avoid that kind of situation. Or maybe you can dig some trenches or something like that to kind of uh, offshoot the water. But if it's a really crazy area where you can get huge amounts of rain, I would recommend against that type of property. Find something that's slightly sloped. All right. Moving forward to the right type of people. This is very important. Uh, I was at a place, let me tell you the story what happened to me. And I explained to them I wanted to build a, a little shed. Uh, everything was there in the writing. You know, I need a place to, to uh, house my tools and things like that. Uh, I'm going to have fertilizers and stuff like that, bags and buckets and things. And they'll be uh, uh, stored up, you know, properly. And what happened is the people ended up, you know, it was the house house. It wasn't in the country. I live by a bunch of rich people, by the way, too. So what the people decided was it was unsightly to have a bunch of bags stacked on a pallet covered with a, a tarp 
uh, you know, and then they didn't want any like kind of shed or anything built there. They were just, it just wasn't, it basically wasn't rubbing them right. Well, guess what? I had to leave. I want to talk about my methods of, of uh, my strategies on how to uh, utilize, how to, how to lose the least amount, uh, you know, with all your hard work, take your work with you. But yeah, I had to leave. And it's because of the people. They own the land and, you know, they had their own ideas of how things should be ran and it didn't really fit mine. And I found actually a lot of a, a better place. Give you guys perspective, I have a place that's got about two, oh, it's probably got about five acres of forestry behind it. So I have all kinds of wild animals. Nobody sprays pesticides, insecticides, and herbicides and things like that. I have all the nature to help me out with my farm. And it's just beautiful. I have an entire acre of flat land. There's a lake in the middle of the forest uh, where frogs are living in my garden, eating my bugs and stuff like that. So a very beautiful thing. So yeah, I think that you might want to take things into consideration. There's things that you never can tell. Uh, you know, if people get divorced, you know, as a couple, Everything looks good on the outside, but on the inside, there's a lot of bad things. You set up shop, you start rototilling that, that garden or building a greenhouse or whatever you're doing. Next you know they get divorced and the house needs to be split up and you're stuck with nothing. You need to move. If people are very old, they may pass on. You know, these are all things to take into consideration. So it's good to talk to the people, ask them, you know, I'll give you guys for another instance as I ask these people, what's your, uh, you know, uh, uh, what? What, what, what do you guys want out of this, this house? Like, what's your intentions, basically? You know, long-term, short-term, like, oh, yeah, we're looking to sell it in about three years, five years from now, but that gives you plenty of time to garden. I just looked and said, yeah, no, we're going to pass on, you know. It takes a good year to two years to develop that soil, you know, to get ready to start growing. So find out what you're going to need. Make sure that you ain't going to have to move and come up with a moving strategy. We're going to talk about that. Irrigation is the next one. Uh, go out there and take a look at what they got. Uh, if you're not too savvy, uh, it's very easy to install irrigation. It's like a big giant puzzle, right? Not even a big, big giant puzzle. It's just a puzzle. Basically, you can get yourself a uh, small little hacksaw or even those little pipe cutters for Schedule 40 uh, PVC pipe. It's all plastic. You basically just take a, uh, you know, shut off the main. Uh, some of these places like mine is hooked up to a sprinkler system that uh, already has a shut off. So all I had to do is didn't have to shut off the water in their house, just shut off the, the sprinkler uh, system there. And basically you cut, you put a T, a T fitting, and you hot glue it. You want to make sure that you read the label and everything. That makes sure that's going to fit the type of uh, PVC that you're using. Use Schedule 40. It's the thicker type of PVC, uh, less prone to crack in the sun and things like that. And handle high pressures. So, yeah, basically all you do is glue and fit things together. Not very difficult at all. If, if you're digging a trench and you're running yourself a spigot into the, the place where you're going to garden or farm, uh, before you bury it, the, the pipe, turn on the pressure and make sure you got no leaks. If you got a little pinhole leak or something, tear it apart and do it again, just in that area. So, <coughs> excuse me, let's run into plot inspection. This one's really important. Uh, you guys uh, understand that uh, heat and cold moves in different ways. There could literally be a brick wall on the other side of that brick wall could be a whole nother world of insects, uh, temperatures, its own uh, uh, climate, basically. But what we're talking about here is mainly uh, insects and things like that. So this is going to give you a general idea of what's going on around there and, you know, that, that plot that you're, you're looking to garden on. One of the best ways to do that is look in the weeds, uh, check for uh, such things as snail shells and stuff like that. Slugs and snails are really, really bad. Earwigs, they're really, really bad for the garden too. I've been to places where I lift up a piece of plywood and there was literally thousands of uh, earwigs, thousands of them. Uh, these guys will chop off your little seedlings. Uh, the slugs and snails, needless to say, will slime up all, all of your vegetables. They'll climb and eat all over your tomatoes, strawberries they love, decimate the whole entire thing. Uh, something you don't want. So by lifting up rocks, checking in the weeds, expect, inspecting the soil, maybe get yourself a shovel and dig yourself down about a foot and see what if you're going to hit hard pan or, or uh, like in this case where I live, there's decomposed gra uh, uh, gravel or I'm sorry, granite. So you only got maybe about six inches of good soil. The rest of it's just hard, very, very hard, difficult stuff to work with. Some places will have better soil. So these are things you want to take consideration. I've got to explain all this in 15 minutes, my allotment here. So I'm going to try to do my best to get it all in. Um, plot inspection. So next is my personal mobility and investment strategy and why you should care. Now, what happens is they call it digital sharecropping in the... Um, 
like YouTube content creators world. So basically, like you, you, you've got to think of these people's land that you want to farm on, just like YouTube, Facebook, and things like that, where you're coming in, you're building your brand, right? Just as I'm doing this show, I'm making this podcast, and I'm helping, I'm, I'm creating content. Well, a lot of people are coming to see uh, all the people like myself who are creating content for free. Some of us are paying for it. The majority of us are paying for it. I'm paying to do this show. Um, but what's happening is that YouTube or Facebook or any of the other people can just literally say, you know what, we don't want you anymore. We cut you off. Bam, you just lost all your hard work, all the money, the time, everything. You're gone. Where do you go? Unless you've saved all your content and you're able to put it on a different platform, then you're, if not, you're completely screwed. you got to start from scratch again. So this is why it's very important. Uh, my strategy is called biodegradable container gardening. You can find it at biodegradablecontainergardening.com. Uh, it's, I've invented a uh, container gardening that's biodegradable. But as I was telling you guys, I had to move, right? So what happened is I moved my entire garden, my entire operations within about a week. I tore down my greenhouse. The very first thing I did is um, I own a Vino's trailer. That's what I'm towing behind me. Sorry about the background noise, guys. This is my work commute. That's why you're, what you're hearing in the back. But I'm, I'm carrying an enclosed Vino's trailer behind me to work right now. And that's basically what I did is I took all of my five-gallon containers, because that's how I grow all my food, and I, I, there was living plants in them, guys. And I just picked these guys up, put them inside the uh, um, enclosed trailer so the wind wouldn't ruin them. I had about a 15-minute uh, drive to the new plot that I found. I basically laid down a wood pallet. I screwed some pipes uh, onto the side of these pallets. I did two rows. I did a four-foot on one end, left about two feet of space in the center, did another four-foot a wide row of about uh, four by by uh, 40 feet and I went and got all my baskets stuck them on here on the, the pallets ran some irrigation line popped in my drip irrigation so it's all automated um, and then I, I nailed some uh, posts in the ground and I just got some PVC pipe some inch and a half PVC pipe and made these quick little hoop houses invested in, I think it was like 20 bucks into some bird netting uh, about 50 by 25 foot and just drape that over the hoop house to keep the birds and animals and everybody out while I built the new greenhouse. So literally, uh, as I like to say, I don't own the land, but I own some of the best soil on the planet. And wherever I go, that soil goes with me. So that's where I look at it. It's definitely an investment, but you're going to have to look at uh, the ratios of if you are going to do in-ground gardening and you need to buy yourself a rototiller, you got gas, you got maintenance and oil changes and things like that. You got the rototiller in itself is a couple thousand dollar investment. If you're going to rent it, it's probably about $150, $200 a day uh, with inflation. Who knows how that's it, that is right now. So things to take in consideration, uh, if you went and had to buy a bunch of pots or make your own pots like I do, uh, it caught its initial investment. But... You get to take that with you, as I said, everywhere you go. And in my case, I'm not watering every single day. I'm not weeding every single day. In fact, I'm not even at my farm every single day. I show up once a week. That's it. Now, not to say that I live in, in Candyland and everything's just absolutely perfect. And I never have any problems. Yeah, I do get some problems, but very minor compared to most people. So my investment was somewhere is probably up to date about $19,000, but I had to buy a lot of stuff in bulk. You don't have to spend that type of money. You could actually start for free with just a shovel, you know, and a, and a rake. Yeah, you, um, and a con like build yourself some free compost bins out of recycled pellets and things like that. You don't have to do what I did. I did mine on a very large scale because I'll be, I'll be growing my food for the rest of my life this way. And again, that soil, the way I look at it is like purchasing land, right? I don't own the land, but I own that soil. And I've got enough soil uh, amendments and things like that to that I'm not even utilizing. I've utilized maybe 50%. I've got enough soil to probably grow easily over a thousand to 1500 different varieties of, of plants. Guys, that's the show. Uh, I hope that that helped you. I think it's very, come up with a plan. If you do need to move, if you are growing in the ground, you're just going to have to eat it. Uh, if they ask you to leave and things change, uh, it's a very uh, uh, not good situation to be in, So, but things to take in consideration. But take in consideration, too, all the food that you ate, or, uh, you know, if you're depending on this for your livelihood to sell the restaurants and farmer's markets and stuff, you know, always keep in your back pocket. That's another thing I'll, I'll tell you guys here is, you know, I said I had about 40, 50 um, opportunities, prospects. Uh, a lot of people asked me, begged me, please pick us. I kept their number says, if anything ever changes, I'll give you a call or if I want to expand. So... 
you don't even have to pick one plot. You could pick many, many plots. Maybe you'll find out that one has more insect pressure than, than another, so you actually would rather move, right? Keep in line with those, those people, keep in contact, and that way you can keep moving around and keeping things going and pretty much produce your own food. Guys, start your own business. This is exciting. So if you guys like this sort of thing, I'm going to do uh, maybe some more input on um, exactly how I gave you guys the big fundamentals to get started here. I know I can't give you guys all oh, yeah, what to grow, how to grow, and all that kind of stuff there. But I gave you guys enough, I think, to get you guys at least excited, I'd say, uh, to either just grow your own food or start, start your own uh, business. So, if, guys, if you like this show, please uh, subscribe, give it a thumbs up, uh, thumbs down if you don't think it's good. Help me get the show off the ground. Give me a review is the biggest thing that I need. If you guys can go out there and give me a review and help, the, if you want the show to keep going, I, I need you guys' help to go do that for me. So, you guys can message me in the, the description below is my email address. Uh, you guys can check this out on Instagram. We'll be soon on TikTok and Facebook and stuff like that. But guys, as I always say, go out there and have yourself a near life experience. Don't lose your muchness. Carry on the fire and human up, my friends.